friends and brothers if you want. I give honor to the Holy Spirit of God, to our Bishop Landau, Lady Connor Landau, Mr. Sidney Campbell, brethren, friends, and everyone that's watching. Greetings in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for joining us for Sunday School today. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we honor you, we adore you, we magnify your name. We give you thanks, Lord, for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us throughout the course of this week. And thank you, Lord, for bringing us into Sunday school yet again today. As we gather together, we pray, Lord, that you'll open up your heart. You'll open our understanding that we can receive the word that you have in store for us today. Father, bless us individually, bless us collectively as we leave Sunday school into your hands. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Today we're beginning a new series, and the series is entitled The Glorious Church. The next few lessons will give us a greater appreciation of the church and the important role that it should play in our lives. Jesus is coming soon and when, he's re when he returns, he's coming back for a glorious church. And I don't know about you, but I want to be ready to be caught up to meet him in the air. When he comes, praise the Lord. We're focusing on lesson 3.1 and the topic of the lesson is I will build my church. The lesson text is Luke 5 verses 1 to 11, Matthew 16 verses 13 to 20. Our focus verse is Matthew 16 verse 18 and i'll read it in your hearing and i say also unto thee that thou art peter upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it praise the lord the truth about god is jesus calls disciples to follow him the truth for my life and yours is, I will be a disciple of Jesus. Praise the Lord. So we begin in the book of Luke. We already know that this is the first of two books which were written by the Greek physician, Luke. He was a Greek physician and also a Gentile Christian. It tells a story from a unique perspective of a Gentile. Writing to Theophilus, Luke records in Luke 1, verses 3 to 4. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things, wherein thou hast been instructed. It was written to Gentiles in Gentile, whereas Matthew presents Jesus as king, Mark presents him as a servant, John presents him as son of God, Luke presents him as the son of man. Luke records those events which demonstrate Christ's humanity. Our lesson objectives today are, firstly, to explore Peter's encounter with Jesus and his revelation of who he is. Secondly, to explore the nature of the church that Jesus promised to build. Let's look at the topic of the lesson. 
I will build my church. These words were spoken by Jesus in response to Peter's revelation of who Jesus is. Peter told him, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Matthew 16, verse 16. Jesus promised to build his church. The word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia, literally meaning to call out. In Greek culture, ecclesia referred to an assembly of male citizens over the age of 20 who lived in the same city. They were called out of their homes and called together to determine the best interest of their city. Similarly, the church consists of those who have been called out of the world and called together into Christ's kingdom that will one day be inaugurated upon the earth. Praise the Lord. Let's get into the scripture lesson text. I'm reading from Luke 5, verses 1 to 3. And I'm reading in the New King James Version. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two sheep standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. A crowd developed around Jesus, eager to hear the word of God. They were even pushing other people out of the way because they were hungry for the word of God. To, to avoid a spiritually hungry crowd, pushing him into the water, Jesus convinced Peter to take him a short distance from land, allowing him to speak to the crowd from his boat. Jesus spoke to the crowd gathered around him on the slope bank of the lake. When he'd finished speaking to the crowd, Jesus turned to address Peter's problem. His inability to catch any fish on the night shift. While many would have offered sympathy, the Lord's solution was to send Peter back out to fish. He said to him, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answered, answering, said unto him, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. That is Luke 5, verses 4 to 5. Peter and his co-workers were tired. When Jesus asked them to cast out the nets again, Peter agreed, even though he felt it was ridiculous to try at that time. Note Peter's partial obedience. He let down the net when Jesus told him to do so. He was doing it out of politeness, not because he thought that he would catch anything. Let's see what happened in Luke 5, verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their nets break. The fish had showed up in massive numbers. For this expert fisherman, embarrassment or frustration gave way to amazement. Jesus had shown himself more powerful than Peter in Peter's area of expertise. Praise the Lord. 
Luke 5, 7 to 8 goes on to say, And they beckoned to their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Oh, yes. Peter knew that Jesus was more than a man. Even the rabbis couldn't perform such a miracle. At the very least, Jesus had to be a prophet. When Peter realised that he was in the presence of the Lord, he felt unworthy of his passenger. That is why he collapsed to his knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When we get a revelation of who Jesus is, we see ourselves as we really are. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah had a similar life-changing experience. Isaiah had a vision of God positioned on a throne within the temple in Jerusalem. Angels were singing around the throne. The entire temple began to shake violently at the sound of God's voice. Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of uncleanness, and I dwell in the midst of people of uncleanness. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And that is Isaiah 6, verse 5. Again, the New King James Version. Much like Peter, Isaiah was confronted with his sinfulness upon seeing God manifested in his power. Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne. Peter saw a net bursting with fish that only divine intervention could explain. These divine encounters portray an important truth. When we see God, the view of ourselves, others, and the world are radically altered. Peter and Isaiah both left their encounter commissioned into God's service. Isaiah became a prophet of Jehovah to the kingdom of Judah, and Peter became a fisher of men. When we meet Jesus, our values change as we realign our lives to match his holy purpose. Praise the Lord. Now, let's turn to Matthew 16, 13. I'll read it in your hearing. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus entered the region of Caesarea Philippi, which was about 25 miles or 46 kilometers northeast of the Sea of Galilee. He had left the mainly Jewish region of Galilee and come to a place which was more populated. By Gentiles. It was an area associated with idols and rival deities. Against this background, Jesus asked the disciples, Who do men say that I am? Let's read their response in verse 14. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. All these answers underestimated Jesus. 
They gave him a measure of respect and honour. But they failed to honour him for who he really is. Jesus is much more than John the Baptist or Elijah or any of the other prophets. It was fine for the disciples to know what others thought about Jesus. But Jesus wanted to know what they personally believed about him. So he asked them in verse 15, but who do you say that I am? Then Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. Jesus complimented Peter for his bold and correct declaration. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by John, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus referred to Peter as Simon bar Jonah, which literally means Simon, son of Jonah. Bar John was his family name. This revelation had nothing to do with his earthly father or his own cleverness. It came from God himself. Peter spoke by divine inspiration, even if he didn't know it at the time. We all need a supernatural revelation of Jesus Christ. One songwriter said, everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And we're not talking about just head knowledge. We're talking about having a personal understanding, a deep personal understanding and a revelation of who praise the Lord. Jesus went on to say, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades, as it says in some versions, shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. Here, Jesus uses a simple play on the Greek words Petros and Petra. He calls his disciple Peter, Petros, which means in the Greek, small stone. He then goes on to say, upon this rock, using the Greek word Petra, which means a massive rock or rocky cliff. Upon this rock, this Petra, I will build my church. That is, he will build his church on Peter's solid confession of who he is. It is Jesus who is the rock, the first and great founder of the church. The New Testament makes it abundantly clear that Christ is both the foundation and the head of the church. How do we know? For verses referring to Jesus as the foundation of the church, we can first look at Acts 4 verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. We can then look at Acts 4, verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name 
under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. We can also look at 1 Corinthians 3, 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. For Jesus, as the head of the church, see Ephesians 5, 23, which reads, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Praise the Lord. Looking back to Matthew 16, 18, Jesus also promised that the gates of hell or the gates of Hades, that is, the forces of death and darkness can't prevail against or conquer the church. This is a valuable promise, especially in dark or discouraging times for the church. Praise the Lord. We must remember that this is his church. The church belongs to Jesus and it's built upon the revelation of who he is. Jesus gave the clearest and most precise definition of his mission in Luke 4, 18 to 90, when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the cap to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus was quoting a prophecy from Isaiah 61. He announced the fulfillment of that prophecy. He told his listeners, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Luke 4, 21. Jesus clearly identified the purpose of his ministry. He describes himself as anointed because the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. The title Christ means the anointed one. It represents the Hebrew word Messiah. Jesus' last name was not Christ. It was rather the title that recognized Jesus as being anointed by the Spirit of the Lord for specific tasks, such as those listed in Luke 4 18 to 90. Praise the Lord. As Jesus' disciples, we are called to continue his ministry and extend it to the end of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8. The book of Acts is the continuation of Jesus' ministry through his disciples, through us. Jesus is still doing and teaching in our world. We should see the continuation of that same ministry in our local churches today. When we understand who Jesus is and what his mission is, then we should go and do likewise. Jesus' church is not a building. The term ecclesia always refers to people not a building. The earliest gathering places for worship were 
be levers on, outdoors, and in extreme cases, the catacombs. For many today, the church has become a place where they go and I think that they do. It's important to remember that the church is not just for Sundays. We don't have to wait until we get into the sanctuary to worship God. Worship should be part of our lifestyle. It can be done at any time and anywhere. Praise the Lord. Although we're thankful to God for the building that he's provided us with, we should not be confined to our church base. We must extend outside of the physical walls. Praise the Lord. Just like Jesus, we must seek out the lost. And it doesn't always have to be at the church building. We have gained valuable presence through social media. As born again believers, we are ambassadors of Christ. When our family members, friends and colleagues see us, how do we portray Jesus Christ to them? Instead of reading their Bible, many of them are looking at our lifestyle. Let us purpose in our heart and declare out loud, I will be a disciple of Jesus. As we've said on a previous occasion, a disciple is someone who has committed to follow the teaching and example of another. The relationship between a martial arts student and his teacher, the sensei, provides a modern day example of the relationship between the disciple and his master. If the student just learns knowledge and skills from their sensei, but not how to apply them in real life situations, they are left immature and defenseless. Instead, each student is taken through comprehensive, varied training to shape them holistically and to prepare them for real life situations. The master and disciple model should lead to a complete transformation in all areas of the disciple's life. Jesus Christ offers us a similar relationship that distinctively sets us apart as Christians. His love or his love for us makes our relationship unique. His love isn't based on any good that we've done. The scripture tells us in Romans 5 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Our God wants to develop an intimate relationship with us. Help us to grow and discover our calling. To facilitate this process, we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide us closer to him instead of moving away from him. Brethren and friends, thank you for joining for Sunday School today. I hope that you've learned something from it. Looking forward to next week, the topic is the purpose of the church. 
let me take you through Acts 4, 13 to 35. The focus verse is Acts 4, verse 20. Brethren and friends, may God bless you. May he continue to cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Have a blessed day.